Comparing Communism and Fascism, Part 4, Totalitarianism. One cannot discuss the history of communism without discussing its totalitarian nature. Anyone who has a passing interest in history knows something of the crimes of Joseph Stalin and Mao Zedong. What is often overlooked, however, are the crimes of other communist regimes. Every communist nation devolved into totalitarianism of some form or another. George Orwell wrote his nightmarish novel, 1984, as a direct response to and warning about Stalinism. In every way, communist totalitarianism was similar to fascist totalitarianism. The communists equally met Mussolini's own definition, quote, all within the state, none outside the state, none against the state, unquote. The communists, like the fascists, sought to dissolve the civil society, to undo tradition and shape society anew in their own image. Using reason and science, the communists sought to change human nature and create new human beings. Both the fascists and the communists claimed to be the purveyors of morality and ethics. They both claimed that the state was the source of this morality. Further, they both claimed that morality was not universal. Some groups of people, for whatever reason, did not qualify for the same rights as other people. In the communist universe, the people became synonymous with the state, and the state likewise became synonymous with the party. Thus, anyone who de deviated in the slightest degree from the party line were thus declared to be enemies of the people. Millions of people were murdered, tortured, sent to concentration camps, starved, raped, and abused, all in the name of the people. There is a reason why the fascist and communist states were described by Leszek Kolakowski to be works of evil. The Polish philosopher once wrote that, quote, the devil invented ideological states. That is to say, states whose legitimacy is grounded in the fact that their owners are owners of truth. If you oppose such a state or its system, you are an enemy of truth, unquote. According to Kalikowski, both fascism and communism were inherently evil. In large part, this evil derived from the totalitarianism of both ideologies. Just as in the fascist regimes, the communists sought to destroy the civil society in favor of a holistic and organic community. For the fascists, this organic community was centered around the nation. For the communists, it was centered around the proletariat. For the communists, the end goal was the creation of a classless society, Thus, anything that leads to division was counter-revolutionary. The civil society in its nature is not a unified whole. The communists, like the fascists, sought to break down these walls and create a unified whole. Polish philosopher Leszek Kalikowski notes, quote, If freedom equals social unity, then the more unity there is, the more freedom. The concept of negative freedom presupposes a society of conflict. If this is the same as a class society, and if a class society means a society based on private property, then there is nothing reprehensible in the idea that the act of violence, which abolishes private property, at the same time does away with the need for negative freedom. And thus Prometheus awakens from his dream of power. Unquote. For the communist utopia to exist, the civil society must be destroyed. As a North Korean radio broadcast in 1996 put it, quote, The whole society should be welded together into one solid political force, which breathes, moves, and thinks as one, under the leadership of a single man. Unquote. This totalitarianism is inherent to Marxism. It can be seen from its earliest days. Ludwig Andreas Feuerbach was a German philosopher in the early 19th century. While Marx criticized some of Feuerbach's work on Hegelianism, Feuerbach was nevertheless influential on the younger Marx. Marx respected Feuerbach enough to ask the older philosopher to contribute an essay to a book Marx was editing. Despite his criticisms, 
Marx never, nevertheless wrote Feuerbach personally and stated that Feuerbach had, quote, given socialism a philosophical foundation, unquote. In many ways, Feuerbach had totalitarian inclinations. He once wrote that, quote, the essence of man is contained only in the community and unity of man with man, unquote. According to Feuerbach, a human being was only a human being insofar as he was a member of a group. Individuality did not factor it much into the essence of man. While Marx and Engels, and even Lenin to an extent, used quasi-libertarian rhetoric, there were nevertheless the seeds of totalitarianism buried in the soil of the ideology. In particular, the ways in which Marxism could be considered a political religion helped to sprout those first buds of the totalitarian flower. Marxism, in presenting itself as not only a scientific theory that described the laws of history, but also a salvific movement, immediately set itself on the path of becoming totalitarian. From its inception, its followers began to believe that they held absolute scientific truth that could not be challenged nor refuted. Furthermore, they believed that they were to be the saviors of mankind and usher in a new era of peace and plenty. This sense of a mission to save men's souls, in a sense, is best shown by Lenin. He writes in his book, State and Revolution, quote, By educating a workers' party, Marxism educates the vanguard of the proletariat, capable of assuming power and of leading the whole people to socialism, of directing and organizing the new order, of being the teacher, guide, and leader of all the toiling and exploited in the task of building up their social life without the bourgeoisie and against the bourgeoisie, unquote. For Lenin, this mission for the salvation of mankind necessitated a highly organized and exclusive vanguard in the form of the Bolshevik party. This idea of the revolutionary vanguard was not predicted by Marx himself, but the logic of it seems to be embedded in orthodox Marxism. Thus, anyone who stood opposed to this vision of the world's inevitable future, or even questioned it, could quickly be condemned as either ignorant or evil or both. What kind of person would challenge the law of gravity, as well as try to prevent the spread of life-saving medicine? For the Marxists, such were the people that opposed them. The proletarian revolution was going to inevitably happen as a scientific fact, and it was a further scientific fact that it would improve the lives of every person in the world. Connected to this is the willingness of Marxists to use violence to achieve their goals. As was discussed earlier and will be expanded upon, the Marxists, Marx and Engels in particular, sought a violent and global revolution. They were willing to engage in bloody terror to solidify the dictatorship of the proletariat. These factors, a sense of possessing scientific truth, combined with a salvific humanitarian mission, added to a penchant for violence, leads to a very unstable brew. The result is that, despite its protestations to the contrary, Marxism is an inherently totalitarian ideology. As a totalitarian movement, Marxism and its warped children sought to destroy the civil society. Perhaps the clearest destruction of the civil society is how the communists treated religion. Marxism from its inception was opposed to religion of any kind, describing it as the opiate of the masses. Not only is religion a fairy tale, for the communists, religion propped up the class antagonism inherent in society. Therefore, it must be abolished to bring about the classless utopia. Religion was not merely a matter of personal belief. It was a bulwark against the proletarian revolution. Lenin is explicit in this regard. Religion cannot merely be a private matter. Lenin writes in State and Revolution, quote, The Philistine in misinterpretation of the celebrated formula, religion is a private matter. That is, this formula was twisted to mean that even for the party, of the revolutionary proletariat, the question of religion was a private matter, unquote. 
Throughout Eastern Europe, the communists sought, quote, to reduce the influence of the churches on society, bring them under the bureaucratic control of the state, and transform them into instruments of policy, unquote. In Czechoslovakia and Hungary, priests who did not cooperate were often arrested and imprisoned. Those who remained were often used as informants for the secret police. In both China and Vietnam, Buddhists were systematically persecuted. The Chinese treatment of Tibetan Buddhists will be discussed in a later video, but it should be noted here how the Vietnamese communists have consistently persecuted Buddhists who did not tow the party line. The communists consistently targeted organized religion, either for outright elimination or bringing it to heel. The destruction of religion was continually a key aspect of communist totalitarianism. Historian Carol Bartosek observes that, quote, the constant strategy of communist repression, whose central aim was always the establishment of absolute power and the elimination of political rivals and anyone else who had any sort of real power in society, was to attack systematically all the organisms of civil society. Because the aim was a monopoly on power and truth, the necessary targets were all other forces with political or spiritual power, unquote. Bartosek was making this observation in the context of communist regimes in Central and Southern Europe, yet his words are applicable to every communist dictatorship. Religion was not the only aspect of civil society that was attacked. Just as in fascism, under communism, everything is considered to be political. Kim Il-sung once said that, quote, all human activity is determined by ideology, unquote. Any activity or group that could possibly shape public opinion or otherwise form bonds outside the purview or surveillance of the state were immediately suspect. In Czechoslovakia, the communists often perceived social clubs as being a threat on par with political parties. The Sokol, or Falcon, club had 700,000 members in 1948. It was perceived as a threat, and its leaders were systematically persecuted. By 1950, thousands of members were in prison, and the organization was uprooted. Not just internal organizations or institutions were subject to surveillance or dissolution, but international ones were likewise carefully monitored. Throughout Central and Southeastern Europe, as well as other communist nations, those with links with the outside world were systematically targeted, persecuted, and eliminated. Anyone who was determined to be socially dangerous, people like social democrats, Catholics, Trotskyites, Protestants, were subject to suspicion, if not outright liquidation. Totalitarianism cannot abide by the civil society. One cannot exist with the other. For the totalitarian project to be implemented, the civil society must be destroyed. As Leszek Kolakowski writes, quote, the object of a totalitarian system is to destroy all forms of communal life that are not imposed by the state and closely controlled by it, so that individuals are isolated from one another and become mere instruments in the hands of the state. The citizen belongs to the state and must have no other loyalty, not even to the state ideology." Unquote. In the same manner as the fascists, the communists could not allow the civil society to exist and took active steps to destroy it. Like the fascists, the communists hoped that after the civil society was dead, that they could reshape society in their own image. They hoped that they could mold human beings into the shapes and forms that they wished to see. The communists, like the fascists, wanted to create the new man. They wished to create Homo Sovieticus. Marxism, Leninism, from the beginning, sought to create a, kind, a new kind of society, radically different from the societies in the past. Historian Stephen Courtois notes that, quote, 
The future communist society was to be built upon a proletarian people purified of the dregs of the bourgeoisie, unquote. In seeking this goal, the communists likewise hoped to create a new kind of person to inhabit this sunny upland. Lenin, when envisaging this future society, noted that it would be populated by, quote, a person not like the present man in the street, unquote. The dream of the communist new man goes back even farther than Leninism and is arguably a key facet in Hegelianism and Marxism. Historian A. James Greger notes that, quote, once accomplished, life would find its fullness in love and community. All the alienated properties of humankind would be restored. Humanity, in essence, would become divine, unquote. Pavel Axelrod a Russian-born Marxist theoretician who was prominent in the early 20th century. A member of the Russian Social Democratic Workers' Party, he would later be categorized as a Menshevik. Axelrod commented directly upon this idea of a divine humanity that was to create and be created by the communist utopia. Axelrod wrote that, quote, If there is no God who has created the universe then we are preparing for the appearance upon earth of divine men, possessed of the essence of all-powerful reason and will, appealing to consciousness and self-consciousness, capable through wisdom of changing the world and directing it. That is the psychological basis of all my spiritual and social striving ideas and actions." Unquote. The communists believed that the perfection of mankind was not only possible, but was also inevitable and also necessary. If the communists did not make people perfect, then they would continue to be an oppressed and suffering mass. It was incumbent on the communists, these new humans, to liberate the world and turn history on its head. A. James Greger observes that, quote, the new people would constitute a vanguard that would make history. Without their intervention, the masses would languish as prisoners of a life that would remain sterile and unedifying, unquote. The communists further believed that this process of creating a new society and a new set of human beings needed to be done quickly, lest the revolution fail. Lenin writes in State and Revolution that, quote, within 24 hours after the overthrow of the capitalists and bureaucrats to replace them, in the control of production and distribution, in the business of control of labor and products by the armed workers, by the whole people in arms, all citizens are here transformed into hired employees of the state, which is made up of the armed workers, unquote. One should note the rapidity of the timeline in which Lenin wishes this to be achieved. He conceives that within a single day after the revolution, Every man, woman, and child become agents of the communist state. There is no room whatsoever for a civil society. The new men have no need for relationships outside of the state apparatus. Quote, all within the state, none outside the state, none against the state, unquote. The creation of this new man and his new society was of utmost importance. Some communist leaders believed it to be the most important thing. Stalin once said in a speech in October of 1932, quote, your tanks will be worth nothing if the soul in them is rotten. No, the production of souls is more important than the production of tanks, unquote. Several methods were utilized to try to create this new man, many of which will be discussed throughout this video, and many of which are implied. A few methods will be discussed here briefly. In all communist nations, particularly in the Soviet Union, the educational system was hijacked. The communists wholeheartedly agreed with Aristotle, quote, give me a child until he is seven, and I will show you the man, unquote. Like the fascists, the communists sought to use schools to indoctrinate children into their ideology. Ironically, in the Soviet Union, in promoting their ideology, they ultimately utilized older forms of indoctrination. Historian Sheila Fitzpatrick observes of the USSR in the 1930s, quote, 
classroom discipline was emphasized, and the authority of teachers and parents over the pupils were reinforced. Later in the 1930s, school uniforms reappeared, making boys and girls in Soviet high schools look very like, much like their predecessors in Tsarist gymnasia, unquote. Adults were also subject to endless propaganda and indoctrination. In North Korea, obedience is reinforced weekly amongst the adult population. North Koreans weekly are required to engage in Maoist-style struggle sessions, wherein they confess their sins. Historian Pierre Rigolot observes of this practice, quote, Once a week, every North Korean attends an obligatory indoctrination meeting and a criticism and self-criticism meeting. The latter is known in North Korea as a balanced sheet of life. Everyone must accuse himself of, of at least one political fault and must reproach his neighbor for at least two faults, unquote. These kinds of confessional rituals were rep replicated throughout the communist world. In some Eastern European nations, prisoners were forced to partake in these same kinds of activities. Further, the prisoners themselves acted as indoctrinators and torturers. To create the new society and the new man, the old society needed to be destroyed root and branch. To this end, all the communist nations engaged in extensive and bloody social engineering. In the Soviet Union, groups like the Cossacks and the Kulaks saw their property stolen, their ways of life destroyed, and themselves either sent to concentration camps or murdered. These groups were considered counter-revolutionary, threats to the birth of the new society. Vasily Grossman was a Russian novelist who became a world-renowned journalist during the Second World War. He followed the Red Army through the bloody conflict and even reported on the liberation of Nazi death camps. In his novel, Forever Flowing, Grossman dramatically summarized the Bolshevik view of the Kulaks. Quote, Thus did Lenin and Stalin say, Kulaks are not human beings. Unquote. To the communists, it was impossible for the Kulaks or the Cossacks or the bourgeoisie to take part in the new society. The new men would not countenance them to live amongst them. Those that opposed the Soviet regime were no longer considered to be human beings. Many other groups were subjected to this kind of dehumanization. The Chinese communists also tried to re-engineer society in their own image by destroying traditional societal relations, norms, and customs. Customs that had been present in Chinese society for millennia. They attempted to drive wedges in local villages, turning neighbor against neighbor. Historian Jean-Louis Margolin observes how, quote, the communists, including Mao himself, began to play at social engineering by trying to artificially to polarize carefully defined rural groups and then decreeing that this polarization was the major cause of peasant discontent. These groups were determined in a highly arbitrary fashion." Unquote. Similarly, such targeting of counter-revolutionary elements in society was replicated in every other communist nation. In Vietnam, the Hmong were targeted. In Cambodia, Vietnamese and other minorities were targeted. The targeting of ethnic minorities will be discussed in a later video. Besides ethnic minorities, religious persons were likewise targeted. Anything that was reminiscent of the old society was slated for destruction, either quickly or slowly. In destroying the old society, the communists also sought to destroy the old morality. The ethics of the past were to be supplanted by the more rational ethics of the communist new men. Whereas previous systems of morality were focused upon prohibiting specific behaviors and strove for an application of consistent principles, the new morality largely devolved into whether one was favored by the regime or loyalty to a particular ideology. Historian Vladimir Tismanu notes that, quote, 
Within this construct, morality was defined in terms of loyalty to a sense of ultimate historical transcendence, unquote. Furthermore, considering the mission that the communists gave themselves to be the vanguard of the revolution that would free the world and redeem mankind, it was only natural that the communists would believe that they were engaged in, quote, man's salvation of himself, unquote. In destroying the old morality, the communists sought to build their own. Because the new men would create their own morality, distinct from the old and necessarily better, and because the communists were the vanguard of these new men, it followed that the communist state became the source of the new morality. Because the communist state was the source of this morality, then it was permitted to do what it will. Tismanu notes that under communism, quote, the state was beyond moral limitations, for it was the only producer of morality, unquote. The communists could justify starving millions of people, using millions more as slaves, and murdering still millions more, because after all, they were trying to save mankind. It should go without saying that the perfect new communist man was not created, nor was the sunny upland of his utopia created. Further, the persecution of perceived enemies nearly never truly abated. New enemies were constantly identified and eliminated. New crimes and conspiracies were discovered. The work of creating the new man never ended and never could end. Polish philosopher Leszek Kolakowski observes this directly. Kolakowski writes, quote, When we speak of totalitarian regimes, we have in mind not systems that have reached perfection, but rather those which are driven by a never-ending effort to reach it, to swallow all channels of human communication and to eradicate all spontaneous life, social life forms, unquote. Communists sought to create new men, a new humanity who would be perfect, bereft of the sins that have plagued human nature for millennia. The new men would forge their own path into the bright future. The communists believed that, since they were the vanguard of these new men, it was necessary that the Communist Party take absolute leadership and control. Further, that anyone who deviated in the slightest degree from the party line was to be purged from their ranks. Who would dare to question the path to the bright future? From the very beginning, Marxist-Leninists organized themselves in a strict, exclusive, hierarchical party. As the vanguard party of the proletariat, it alone was in the possession of truth. Because of this closed-ranked power structure, it was expected that every party member adhere closely to the party line. It was the only way to create the new man. Yuri Piatikov was a key Bolshevik leader throughout the 1920s, holding posts in the Red Army as well as the Donbass Coal Industry Board, and further was a close friend of Lenin. A supporter of Trotsky, Piatikov, was exiled in 1926 before he was allowed to return in 1929. While still in good standing in the Bolshevik regime, Piatikov once said that, quote, in order to become one with this great party, one sh he would fuse himself with it, abandon his own personality, so that there is no particle left inside him which was not at one with the party, did not belong to it, unquote. Later, in 1937, despite his loyalty, Piatikov was executed as part of the Great Terror. The party was not only the sole possessor of truth, it was also supposed to be the embodiment of the people. Andrei Sakharov was a Soviet nuclear physicist and often referred to as the father of the Soviet hydrogen bomb. Sakharov later became a renowned Soviet dissident 
for which he won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1975. Sakharov once told an audience that, quote, the slogan, the people and the party are one, painted on every fifth building are not just empty words, unquote. Further, the party and the people, the new society, were all to be fused into one. With the destruction of the restrictive walls of the civil society and the iron discipline of the party, the whole of the communist society, every individual were to act as one. One party, one people, one goal. Stalin emphasized this point in 1923. He writes that, quote, the party was a self-acting organism, unquote. There could be no deviation from this line Discipline was of utmost importance. Like a phalanx, if any party member broke rank, it would lead to the collapse of the formation. This party line must be followed, even if it stretched rationality and reality. Yuri Piotrkov once said that, quote, Yes, I shall consider black something that I felt and considered to be white, since outside of the party. Outside accord with it, there is no life for me, unquote. This sentiment is literally Orwellian. Yet, it was not enough to save Piotrkov from the firing squad. Because of this insistence to follow the party line, purges within the party ranks were frequent and brutal. Anyone found to be wanting in loyalty or backed the wrong person could find themselves in a concentration camp, or worse, murdered. Party members were in dan were danger during the Great Terror between 1937 and 38. Vladimir Tismanu observes that, quote, the political history of the international communist movement is the history of continual purges of different factions branded by the victors as anti-party deviations, unquote. The communists, particularly the leadership, believed thoroughly that these purges were necessary to preserve the vitality of the Soviet state and the Bolshevik party. Not only did they believe it was necessary, but that it was entirely logical. Historians J. Arch Getty and Oleg V. Naumov observe, quote, according to Stalin's formula, criticism was the same as opposition. Opposition inevitably implied conspiracy. Conspiracy meant treason. Algebraically, therefore, the slightest opposition to the regime or failure to report such opposition was tantamount to terrorism. Any deviation was liable to destroy the great work of the Communist Party and must be purged completely. Sin needed to be rooted out. This emphasis upon party discipline was not solely seen in the Soviet Union, but was present in all other communist nations. In Eastern Europe, they were extremely like the USSR. Historian A. James Greger observes in a lengthy quotation the ways in which the Eastern European communist states engaged in the same kind of purges and enforcement of party discipline as the Soviet Union. Greger writes, quote, all the satellite nations indulged in a common faith that embodied itself in a leader charged with defending and fostering orthodoxy. Maintaining the faith produced elaborate domestic security arrangements that involved secret police and intricate networks of citizen surveillance. Fostering the faith generated a system of supervision for education, publication, the transfer of information, and civilian communication Attendant upon those efforts, a series of political trials decimated any whose heterodoxy might fuel dissent. All opposition was foreclosed, employing suppression of varying degrees of severity. Supplemented by the expulsion of entire ethnic communities, Eastern and Southeastern Europe were cleansed of any real or fancied anti-communist opposition." Unquote. In the Chinese Communist Party, iron discipline was reinforced repeatedly. The Chinese Communists followed the example of the Soviet Union, but implemented their own variations. 
In particular, the Chinese communists developed a method in which victims would internalize their own guilt, as well as break down their senses of self and dignity. The struggle session. A common turn representative from the Soviet Union observed the Chinese praxis in Yan'an province. The common turn representative described the Chinese struggle sessions in this way, quote, party discipline is based on stupidly rigid forms of criticism and self-criticism. The accused only, has only one right, to repent his errors. The cruel method of psychological coercion that Mao calls moral purification has created a stifling atmosphere inside the party in Yan'an. Everyone should know the intimate thoughts of everyone else. Unquote. Those who deviated from the party line had to confess their wrongdoings before their peers in a ritual of groveling and self-abasement, begging forgiveness for their terrible sins. Even then, this was often not enough. Kang Sheng was a communist official who maintained high positions of power throughout the 1950s and became a key leader of the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s. Kang Sheng, during a struggle session, motioned to the participants and declared, quote, You are all agents of the Kuomintang. The process of your re-education will go on for a long time, unquote. The totalitarianism of Communist Party discipline can be seen in the ways in which those persecuted often internalized their own guilt, the ways in which they became collaborators in their own persecution. At the height of the doctor's plot in the early 1950s, a topic which might be explored in a later video, a Jewish Soviet historian Isaac Mintz was coerced to support the investigations. Mintz was threatened and had to sign a letter published in Pravda condemning the accused doctors. After Stalin died and the case was largely dropped and the lies were revealed to be what they were, Mintz could breathe a sigh of relief. However, he did not necessarily condemn the Soviet practice of justice. Quote, Mintz could accept his public denunciation and participate in an obvious frat fabrication of Jewish sentiments because these were part of the standard public ritual that one had to go through to be a Bolshevik and to show one's commitment and loyalty, Unquote. The phalanx cannot be broken. Deviation cannot be tolerated. Every party member must be in lockstep, marching, into the bright future of the new man. Any departure from this iron discipline would be met with swift and cruel punishment. The repression of the communist totalitarian states was terrifying in its scale and viciousness. To enforce the party line, to destroy the civil society, to create the new man, repression must be widespread and brutal in its application. In the Soviet Union, punishment was swift and arbitrary. Often the regime would criminalize entire groups of people merely for their class affiliation. For the Bolsheviks, hunting down kulaks, Cossacks, and the bourgeoisie was of utmost importance. Martin Latsis was the first leader of the Cheka, the Soviet secret police. Latsis told his men directly how to conduct investigations against enemies of the state. He said on November 1st, 1918, quote, we are exterminating the bourgeoisie as a class. In your investigations, don't look for documents and pieces of evidence about what the defendant has done, whether in deed or in speaking or acting against Soviet authority. The first question you should ask him is what class he comes from. What are his roots, his education, his training, and his occupation? Unquote. For the Cheka, the only real evidence that counted against someone was whether someone belonged to a particular class. With stringent sentences attached, stealing grain or arriving late to work, carried with it sentences of at least five years forced labor, <laughs> 
in a concentration camp. Sheila Fitzpatrick notes how workers received a particular form of discipline from the workers' state. She writes, quote, There was particular concern about labor discipline, and a series of decrees were issued imposing stern penalties for absenteeism and other offenses, and attempting to reduce the very high rate of labor turnover in the factories. Unquote. There is some irony in the worker state becoming a more stringent manager than any capitalist or even feudal manager ever was. The Soviet Union would export its repressive apparatus all around the world. Eastern Europe followed the USSR's example more closely than other places. Millions of people in Eastern Europe were purged, sent to concentration camps, deported, tortured, and or murdered. To give one specific example, in East Germany, following the fall of the Nazi regime, the Soviet occupiers, quote, interned 122,000 people in their zone in 1945 to 1950, 43,000 of whom died in, det in detention, and 736 of whom were executed. By its own estimates, the Socialist Unity Party adopted repressive measures against 40,000 to 60,000 people, unquote. The communists practiced this kind of repression around the world. This repression is clear in all of the communist nations, but North Korean repression is of note for its brutality as well as wantonness. In North Korea, there are many actions that carry with it the possibility of being sent to a concentration camp or being murdered. Singing in public, accessing the internet, sarcastic comments, buying a house, watching foreign films, having a hairstyle not approved by the state, Mother's Day's cards, among many other things, most inane, are all illegal in the Hermit Kingdom. Quote, at least 47 crimes are punishable by the death penalty, unquote. If, run, if one runs afoul of the party during the recurring purges, or expressing banned opinions, or having a body piercing, a person and their entire family could be arrested. The secret police always come at night. If one is not immediately executed, one would be sent to one of, one of innumerable concentration camps. In these camps, people are used as slave labor, endure torture and abuse, and left to starve. There is, quote, pervasive use of hunger as a weapon to break prisoners' resistance, unquote. Historian Pierre Rougelet paints a haunting picture of the conditions of these concentration camps. Rigolo writes, quote, The few eyewitness descriptions of these camps mention total isolation, high barbed wire fences, German shepherd dogs, armed guards surrounding minefields, poor and insufficient food, and extremely hard work involving the excavation of mines, quarries, and irrigation canals, as well as woodcutting operations. Prisoners work 12 hours a day, followed by two hours of political training. Hunger is perhaps the worst torture. Detainees try to eat anything from frogs and toads to rats and earthworms. Prisoners not only suffer progressive physical decay, they also are forced for special are used for special tasks such as the digging of secret tunnels or work at dangerous nuclear projects. Some have been used as moving targets during shooting practice by guards and troops. Torture and sexual violence are common. Unquote. In some of these camps, North Korean doctors engage in human experimentation particularly the effects of hunger on the human body. People are deliberately starved to pursue, pursue a perverse science. In many camps, the bodies of the dead are burned in ovens to collect the fat for other uses. The conditions are often so terrible that despite the danger, people often try to escape. At the Yadok camp, 
witnesses report that at least 15 people try to escape every year. Braving machine gun nests and electrified razor wire, these starving and tortured people desperately try to get out. Invariably, they are captured and immediately executed in front of everyone as an example. So far, no one has ever managed to escape from Yadda. The human cost of these camps is staggering. Because of the isolated nature of North Korea, one cannot be certain of exactly how many people have died in the camps. Estimates show that every year in Camp 22 in North Korea, 36,500 people die. If we multiply this number by the 46 years of the regime's existence, we find Korean communism directly responsible for the death of more than one and a half million people. This number does not include the millions who died from the famines of the 1990s. Though the communist regimes were fully aware of the human cost of their plans and their repression, they nevertheless justified it. According to the official historian of the Bolshevik party, Yemelian Yarolovsky, the purges were justified because it protected, quote, the cells of the party and Soviet organism from degeneration, unquote. If the purges had not happened, Soviet society would be destroyed by cancerous individualism. Molotov was in Stalin's inner circle for many years. He was the diplomat that helped to negotiate the secret pact with Nazi Germany. Molotov acknowledged that many innocent people were murdered by the repression, yet he still justified the secret police in the concentration camps. Molotov said, quote, Of course there were excesses, but all was permissible to my mind for the sake of the main objective, keeping state power. Our mistakes including the crude mistakes, were justified, unquote. The irony of this, however, is that Molotov's wife, Polina, was arrested and sent to a concentration camp. Molotov himself was almost the victim of Stalin's wrath. Stalin's death was the only thing that saved him. Molotov's justification is telling, the imprisonment, torture, and murder of millions of people was justified to keep state power. This justification would easily apply to every other repressive measure in every other communist nation. The repressive apparatus, the secret police, the concentration camps, the surveillance, the purges, were all in service of the creation of a new society through the destruction of the old. It is the bluntest example of the overarching goal of totalitarian ideologies, the creation of a state with absolute power. The communists, despite whatever rhetoric to the tr contrary, all created totalitarian megastates with absolute power over the lives of everyone in their nation. Marx's protestations that communism would create a classless, stateless utopia are undermined not only by the historical record of actual attempts of implementing communism, but Marx's stance is undermined by Marx himself. As was discussed in a previous video, Marxism's analysis of the state was deeply flawed and engaged in special pleading. Marx acknowledged that the transition between socialism and communism would require a state apparatus that would eventually wither away. And that apparatus would be utilized to protect the proletarian revolution. Marx, in his own analysis, is justifying a highly centralized state that would be utilized to conduct bloody purges against enemies of the revolution before withering away. As will be discussed in a later video, Marx himself justified the use of terrorism to achieve his goals. Lenin himself argues that anyone who claims that Marx was in favor of decentralized power is deluding themselves. Lenin argues that those who make such an argument 
are essentially trapped by petty bourgeois false consciousness. Lenin writes in State and Revolution, quote, Federalism arises as a principle from the petty bourgeois views of anarchism. Marx is a centralist. Only people full of petty bourgeois superstitious faith in the state can mistake the destruction of the bourgeois state for the destruction of centralism, unquote. Lenin is making several claims here. For one thing, that Marx was not in favor of decentralized state authority. For another, that claims to the contrary are not only petty bourgeois, but also quasi-anarchist. It should be noted that most of Lenin's state and revolution as a repudiation of leftist anarchism. Further, the idea of federalism itself is a petty bourgeois delusion. The only true proletarian state must be highly centralized. The state has absolute power to guide society toward the perfect utopia of the future. It has the power to reshape human beings at will and to eliminate anyone who contradicts it. Because it was pursuing the perfection of society, a noble goal at the end of history, because it was guided by science and reason, therefore, everything must be trusted to it. Nikolai Bukharin was a member of the old Bolsheviks, a close associate of Lenin and an author of many works of Marxist-Leninist philosophy, including the ABC of Communism. Nikolai Bukharin was so confident in the communist state that he once stated that, quote, all tasks can be solved by communist decree, unquote. The irony, of course, is that Bukharin was eventually executed during the Great Terror of 1937 to 38. Even then, in his final letter to Stalin, he incriminated himself and begged forgiveness for his terrible deviationism. No amount of groveling, however, saved him from the firing squad. If anything can be achieved by the order of a commissar or a central committee, then ultimate faith must be put in those central sources of power. They must be listened to completely and utterly. Their orders must be followed to the letter Otherwise, the new man cannot be birthed. The new society, the utopia, cannot come to fruition. During the interminable show trials in the Soviet Union, one of the prosecutors had this to say in the courtroom, quote, every directive of the government is an operational order that must be unconditionally fulfilled. Only complete execution of orders and discipline will ensure total victory in the battle to build a socialist economy, unquote. Every order must be followed in its entirety. The decisions of the state cannot be questioned. How else will the new society be created? What else can be said about those who question or oppose orders except that they are counter-revolutionaries and traitors? The state must guard against these counter-revolutionary elements at all cost. They can pop up from anywhere and at any time even within the inner ranks of the Communist Party. Pierre Rigolo describes the ways in which surveillance is conducted on every person in North Korea, even the top leadership. Rigolo writes, quote, North Korean cadres receive a number of privileges and material benefits, but they are also under extremely tight control. They are forced to live in a special area all their telephone conversations are closely monitored, and any audio or video cassettes in their possession are regularly examined. Because of the systematic jamming of foreign broadcasts, all radios te and televisions in North Korea can pick up only state channels. To make any journey, special permission is required." Unquote. Totalitarianism, particularly communist totalitarianism, often finds itself trapped in a dangerous dilemma. Because the communist state was motivated by a goal of creating the perfect human society, because it was inspired by science and reason in the inevitable, inevitable progress of history, and because it was the sole possessor of truth and could not make mistakes, 
and because it was constantly surrounded by enemies both within and without. Therefore, the communist state must lie. The communist state must lie consistently and about everything. It cannot admit to any wrongdoing or any mistake. Like its goal, the communist state is perfect. The Hungarian novelist George Conrad notes this directly. Conrad writes, quote, Because the regime is captive to its own lies, it must falsify everything. It falsifies the past. It falsifies the present, and it falsifies the future. It falsifies statistics. It pretends not to possess an omnipotent and unprincipled police apparatus. It pretends to respect human rights. It pretends to fear nothing. It pretends to pretend nothing." Unquote. The Communist Party around the world sought to create for themselves a, total a totalitarian state with absolute power over every human being living in the nations that were subsumed under the red tide. One cannot separate the history of communism from totalitarianism. The communists from the earliest days of the ideology were key shapers in formation of totalitarianism as a concept. Vladimir Tismanu asserts that, quote, if there had been no Lenin, there would have been no totalitarianism, unquote. While it was Mussolini who had coined the term, it truly was Lenin who had birthed totalitarianism. Arguably, the Soviet Union was the first totalitarian state in the world. With its radical ideology that believed it was the only one who possessed truth and a desire to attempt to perfect society using violence, utilizing the power of an absolute state to achieve its ends. Tismanu argues that in creating the first totalitarian state, quote, Lenin opened the door to the realization of radical evil, unquote. A radical evil that would be utilized by both communist and fascist regimes the world over. Totalitarianism is yet another way in which communism and fascism are like one another. Both communism and fascism were radical ideologies that sought to reshape society, to destroy the civil society. However, an aspect of this destruction of civil society that is overlooked is that it necessarily involves the, the destruction of private property. Polish philosopher Leszek Kolakowski demonstrates this directly. Kolakowski writes, quote, The point where despotism differs from totalitarianism is the destruction of civil society. But civil society cannot be destroyed until and unless private property, including the private ownership of all the means of production, is abolished." Unquote. Kolakowski is demonstrating a key way in which totalitarianism is necessarily opposed to private property and free markets. This is yet another thing that the two ideologies have in common. In destroying the civil society, both fascism and communism sought to create their new society, populated by new men. Human nature would be rewritten. Alexander Watt was a Jewish-Polish poet who had been deported to Kazakhstan with his family by the Soviet regime. Watt wrote about the, the process in which human beings were being rewritten. Watt writes, quote, Communism is the enemy of interiorization of the inner man. The killing of the inner man, and that is the essence of Stalinism. The inner man must be killed for the communist decalogue to be lodged in the soul. Unquote. The ego, the individual, must be smothered and eradicated. For both the communists and the fascists, anyone who questioned or opposed their ethos were necessarily traitors that needed to be met with violence. Not only individuals, but families, villages, towns, entire ethnicities were targeted for destruction. This targeting of entire ethnicities for collective punishment 
is most often associated with Nazism. But arguably, it was the Bolsheviks who engaged in it first. Tismanu observes that, quote, at the core of Lenin's vision of a new society lay an exter exterminist ethos, unquote. Counter-revolutionaries were to be destroyed, root and branch. Further, in implementing this new society by destroying the old with the power of the absolute state and its violence, and necessarily followed that individual human beings were no, long, no longer matter in the grand scheme. What would the happiness of any given individual matter when compared to the inevitable historical evolution of the proletarian state? Thus, both fascism and communism sought to destroy individuality, quote, making human beings as human beings superfluous, unquote as Hannah Arendt put it. In the face of the totalitarian state, the heart of any given person would quail. The weight of the oppressive surveillance state with its secret police, its torture chambers, its concentration camps, its slave labor, and its mass graves all pile upon the individual, crushing him into nothing. Philip Rav was a literary critic born in Ukraine in 1908. He eventually managed to escape to the United States. It was while in the United States that he penned these remarks on the nature of Soviet totalitarianism. Quote, these are trials of the mind and of the human spirit. In the Soviet Union, for the first time in history, the individual has been deprived of every conceivable means of resistance. Authority is monolithic. Property and politics are one. Under the circumstances, it becomes impossible to defy the organization, to set one's will against it, when one cannot escape it. Not only does it absorb the whole life, but it also seeks to model the shapes of death." Unquote. Brav's statement would equally apply to the fascist regimes of Germany, Italy, and Japan. Arguably, the greatest folly of communism was its perfectionism. No person could ever live up to the strict standards of the communist totalitarian state. As a result, millions perished in the largest social experiment in human history. Yet, the communists pushed forward anyway, wading through the mountains of bodies emaciated and abused, and fording the rivers of blood. The same can be said of the murderous follies called fascism and Nazism. These three cousins together left behind millions of corpses in their quest for perfection.